Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice. Through interviews, discussions, and music, your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your hosts, Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Our guest today has likely already served as an inspiration to many of our listeners, perhaps in her writings about womanhood, commentaries on the philosophical problems in modern society, or in her lovingly devoted explanations of the work of her husband, Dietrich. Dr. Alice von Hildebrand is a beautiful woman who's lived an inspiring and heroic life, and we were grateful to meet with her to record this episode. A little disclaimer, you'll sometimes hear the microphone jostling around a bit as she animatedly spoke to us in the comfort of her living room, but what she says is moving and profound and will overwhelm all the technical shortcomings in the recording. And just before we begin, we'd like to draw your attention to a must-read article that she wrote back in 2006 for the St. Austin Review. We'll put a link to it on the show notes page because it's one of the best writings on aesthetics, at least in my experience in reading for plainly explaining why people can make bad or wrong judgments about whether or not something is beautiful. We approached that question here in the interview, too, but we'd encourage you to also read the article. Here's a little taste of it. Quote, Perfect eyesight does not guarantee artistic appreciation. An eagle sees better than we do. A dog's ears register as many sounds that escape us. Yet neither the one nor the other is capable of being moved by beauty. Man alone, among all the creatures known to us in experience, because he is a person endowed with intelligence, free will, and the capacity to love, can perceive beauty, be affected by it, and respond to it. God is beauty itself. He does not need to get acquainted with beauty as angels and men do. Angels, being pure spirits, do not need sense knowledge to get acquainted with certain types of beauty. They do not need the crutches of eyes and ears through which visible and audible beauty is revealed to us. If one's eyesight or hearing is impaired, the beauty accessible through them, even though it does not come from them, will not be perceived. One classical argument brought up against the objectivity of beauty is that artistically sensitive persons can have such diverse views on what beauty is and on the value of individual works of art. My aim is to show that this can be partly explained by a simple fact. Some persons have a wrong approach to beauty and call objects beautiful which, for non-aesthetic reasons, move them. Beauty, when perceived, moves us, but there are objects that move us for reasons totally foreign to art and are easily confused with aesthetic experiences. Beauty touches us, this object touches me, hence it must be beautiful. This need not be true. We shall briefly examine some of the cases in which being affected by an object does not justify our calling it beautiful. There are many such examples. And now for our interview with Dr. Alice von Hildebrand. Your husband Dietrich's work, Aesthetics, has recently been published in two volumes, translated into English by the Dietrich von Hildebrand Legacy Project. In the introduction, he speaks about beauty as a central source of human happiness, touching upon beauty in all aspects of our lives, from the homes we live in and the architectural beauty of the neighboring houses. This is a quote from him. The architectural beauty of the neighboring houses, the beauty of the sun that shines into the house and of the shadow cast by a tree, end quote. Could you summarize for us some of your husband's thoughts on the necessity of beauty in worshiping God in the holy sacrifice of the mass? How is this beauty linked to human happiness? I can simply say truth and beauty are closely uh, related and uh, You know, you understand truth is beautiful and beauty is related to truth. And so, but now in order for us to understand it, the key question is to be receptive. You know, this is one of the things that my my beloved husband was insisting upon. We should be reverent. 
And reverend means to say in a position of receptivity. I'm only a creature. I'm very small. I'm very imperfect. And I must be willing to be uh, taught to be elevated. And I mean, this implies reverence. You know, the role of reverence in his books is absolutely crucial. And this is something which is disappearing more and more. I recall when I was a small girl and I went to very good Catholic schools. And I recall the very moment we entered church, there was awe and silence. Today, I'm grieved and saddened to see people enter church talking and joking. And, uh, you know, you cannot possibly understand that God himself is present if you take this sort of attitude. And so I say, what we must try to do, and the best way to help other people is to start with myself, to live it. And this is the thing, you know, you you teach more by example than by preaching. And even if I know a great deal, relatively speaking, the more I realize that I know, the smaller it should make me. I repeat, this is one of the things that my husband taught me for the day I met him, reverence is a key to vision. If you are not reverence, you are blind and you don't know it. And if you don't know that you are blind, there is no chance of your correcting your blindness. Dr. Von Hildebrand, in the early 2000s, you wrote a wonderful article that's one of the best articles I've ever read on aesthetics. And one of the things that's really great about it is that you explain so clearly how it's possible for people to misperceive beauty. They miss out on something that's actually beautiful, or they think that um, something that isn't actually beautiful is beautiful. And so I'm wondering, what's the source of disagreements over what is beautiful and not? Are there legitimate differences or disagreements to be had? Well, I mean, one thing is certain, uh, some people see more than other people. Some people have no very little sense, for example, for music. They will not distinguish between sublime music and rock and roll. They have no gift for it. Whereas a person who is uh, musically talented understands that you've got to be in an attitude of reference. I mean, as I repeat, if I wanted to summarize my husband's teaching in ethics, it is reverence, reverence, reverence. We realize how weak we are, we're so helpless, constantly need, and this opens our eyes. Teach me, O oh God, because I'm blind. Open my eyes, open my ears, enable me to see what I haven't seen, because I was irreverence. Irreverence makes you blind and deaf and stupid. We live, I mean, what is difficult for modern man to be reverence is that technologically you have accomplished so much. I mean, the world in which we live now is so radically different from the world I live when I was five or six, when already a telephone call was something amazing. You know, mm -hmm. the telephone mm -hmm. rings and it was a quite an event. I mean, today right. we have advanced and advanced. Technologically, we have made giant steps, but this doesn't mean at all that intellectually we are any closer to the truth. It's very dangerous. Do you think it's possible for someone to be poorly formed in their judgments about beauty? In other words, is it possible for someone to be wrong about whether something is beautiful or ugly? Well, you know, once again, this is a huge, huge question. One thing is certain. Our perception of beauty, our sensitivity to beauty, is not given to everyone equally. You know... 
Some people do not see the difference between something which is sublime and something which is vulgar. They don't. You've got to realize that from this point of view, humility is once again one of the great teachers. And to be willing to, you know, I mean, take for example, my husband's youth. He was so blessed to be born and raised in Florence when beauty was queen and when it was. Today, we confuse beauty and loudness or making the headlines. Or teach me, oh my God, to know that I'm ignorant to know that I'm limited and not be depressed by my limits, but to turn to you and say, teach me, O oh Lord, with your help, I will transcend walls. The willingness to learn, and I repeat, as my husband said constantly, reverence. Take, for example, the relationship between man and woman. The beauty of this relationship depends on reverence. The relationship between parents and children, or children or parents. The relationship to great minds. You know, for example, if I turn to philosophy and I read Plato, and if I don't approach him with reverence, I'm going to miss the greatness of his message. What do you think parents can do with children to cultivate reverence and openness towards beauty? Well, I mean, by living in themselves. Take, for example, in my case, I was so impressed by my father's attitude when he entered church, took off his head, and I knew that my father was conscious of the fact that Christ was present in the Holy Eucharist. Live it yourself, not preaching, living. Take, for example, I'm not going to do it, but I mean, when I sit and my two legs wide apart, ha, 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 instead of understanding, you see, you, you must realize that your body is a tabernacle. You see, if Holy Communion, it should form your holy respect for your own body, respect for others. And not only is life more beautiful, but it is said simultaneously, it gives you wings. And in our society, you can say what you please, but systematically, people have tried to eliminate reverence, the way that you laugh the way that you sit, all the question, am I conscious of the fact that I'm God's creature and therefore my own attitude should reflect this? Are you conscious of the fact that you're a person made to God's image of existence or do you forget it? What was unique in your husband's upbringing that made him so sensitive to beauty? Well, I mean, reference. You know, his parents were liberal Protestants. They never went to church, but they had a tremendous sense of beauty. And my husband, at the moment of his conversion, discovered the beauty of the liturgy. And that was a turnaround. And I mean, from this moment on, he grew wings. But you know, to be born and raised in Florence, it's a blessing. Because when he was a young boy, I mean, beauty was dominant. What happened now is modern things have waged war on beauty. Take, for example, music. His sisters were playing the piano or the violin, and it was Beethoven, it was Mozart, it was Bach. Today it is rock and roll. You can tell what a society is like by listening to his music, by paintings. And I mean, as I said, the best way to preach it is to live it. Not preaching, living. And then people might be willing to listen to you and then you can preach. 
How could a musician who has received musical training, but perhaps hasn't had as much contact with the treasures of the sacred musical repertoire, Gregorian chant and Renaissance polyphony, make sure that he or she is well-formed in those things and open to the beauty of them. You know, I tell you something, as soon as I hear Gregorian chant, which I heard from the time I was three or four years old, it forces me on my knees. It's so beautiful. It's so regulated. It's so point upward. All things are possible with God. And even if a, a child is not exposed to the beauty of Gregor as I was, there is Beethoven, there is Bach, there is Mozart. You take, for example, the passion according to St. Matthew. I personally experience it as a religious experience. You know, beauty, where there is beauty, it leads to God. So, I mean, all things are possible with God, but obviously, if you are fed on rock and roll, it's going to be more difficult. What do you think are the spiritual effects on someone's heart of listening to something like rock and roll versus uh, sacred music? Your relationship to your body depends very much on whether or not you're reverent. I mean, we live in a society, if I'm, you're going to say that I'm a pessimist, in a society where reverence has been systematically sapped. You know, for example, the relationship between uh, parents and children. You know, I was amazed when I was a child that we addressed my father or I addressed my mother today. I mean, as I said, the devil never sleeps and he knows full well that destroying reverence in little children is going to prevent them from finding their way to God. What is it about beauty that helps people be reverent? Well, I mean, because... Everything which is in beauty in some way reflects God, you know, imperfect as it is, but nevertheless it points a point. You know, people can live in a very modest apartment and nevertheless have a couple of pictures, of holy pictures, for example, which are feed, I recall when I was a child, the beautiful religious uh, pictures in a home. When you see things that are coarse or that are vulgar or that are impure, what we see and what we hear is going to have an enormous influence on our development. And I mean, you know, we live in a society where it is difficult, but nevertheless, all things are possible with God. Never give up hope. How would you encourage people to practice reverence in their day-to-day -day lives? By trying to live it at yourself. You know, you feel immediately when you meet someone, whether his attitude towards his own, the way that you sit, the way that you laugh, the way that you eat, all this impress. Am I conscious of the fact that my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? I mean, I received Holy Communion this morning, and this should influence my attitude towards my body. Reverence your body. And if you don't reverence your body, you're not going to reverence the body of other people. You know, I mean, as I said, I still believe that my husband was right when he taught me from the day that I reverence is the mother of all virtues. If your husband were giving advice to musicians now, what do you think he would say? Well, I mean, to make a distinction between uh, Mozart and rock and roll. I mean, when you hear uh, sacred music, Bach, the passion according to St. Matthew, you go on your knees. But rock and roll, already the rhythm is something that... Uh, the devil has an easy time because to destroy is easy, to build up is slow and difficult. 
What might you say if a musician feels discouraged that he or she is trying to build up contact with beauty and uh, greater reverence in the congregation they serve? What might you say if they're discouraged in that? And persevere. Don't let yourself be defeated by seeming. Be, persevere and pray. And, you know, something that I do, without you, oh God, I can do nothing. And rejoice in your weakness and say, but with your help, I can transcend. Can. But I may acknowledge your weakness and your defeat and whatever. Don't let yourself be discouraged. Don't let yourself be defeated. I say, I am weak. I have nothing. And the older I get, the more I realize it. But with your help, I can make it. Because I count on your help. Don't, don't accept defeat. To be a Catholic is with God's grace to change defeats into victories through humility. I repeat, to be a Catholic is not to let oneself be discouraged by defeat, but to change defeat through victory, to victory through humility. Without you, I can do nothing. With your help, I will transcend the world. That is the life of sins. I cannot do it alone. He will have the last word. And you know, the worst, you know, we live in a world which is terribly decadent. There is absolutely no doubt about it. And we are coming, inevitably, we are coming closer and closer to the end of the world. Well, someone is going to set the world to fire and we need to destroy it. But instead of being discouraged, simply to say, yes, but simultaneously, it is going to be the hour of your victory because you will have the last word. When I tell you, it's not what I say. It is the teaching of the church that I repeat. Keep that in mind. Without my joy, there is nothing in man which is innocent. But with God's help, you go over mountain. Never let yourself be discouraged. The weaker you are, the more you have to say, indeed, I'm weak, and I accept it, and I know it. But with your help, I can go over walls. You know, the, the power of humility. To be humble is to and this now, to be humble is to be strong. To be humble is to be strong. To be proud is to be weak and sick and to refuse to acknowledge it. You know, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your visit. I'm delighted to meet you. And keep in mind, my door is always <laughs> wide open. <laughs> But I mean, I'm getting very old and taking my last steps. And I mean, this is a very awesome moment when you know that your days are counted and simply say, may God in his goodness help me to take my last steps humbly and lovingly and confidently. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time, if you're interested in learning more about sacred music, be sure to check out the course offerings this summer, 2020, at St. Joseph's Seminary in New York, which, because of the current situation, are migrating to an online format. We're offering Principles of Sacred Music, a history of sacred music, documents, and practical issues, Principles of Chant, a sort of 0-60 to 60 approach to learning Gregorian chant, Teaching Gregorian Chant to Children, a course for teachers that will focus on the Ward Method, Introduction to the Organ for Pianists, taught by the excellent organist Dr. Krista Miller, Director of Music at Houston's Co-Cathedral of the Sacred Heart, and Conducting and Group Vocal Pedagogy for the Parish Music Director, taught by Dr. Timothy McDonnell, Head of Sacred Music and Director of Choral Studies at Catholic University of America. To learn more, go to www.dunwoody.edu. That's spelled D-U-N-W-O-O-D-I-E. 
click on Dunwoody Music, and then Classes. Also, you might check out my personal webpage for some upcoming webinars on chant. Go to www.jenniferdonaldson.com and click on Conferences and Workshops. Until the next episode, may Our Lady protect you and your family. May Christ the Divine Physician restore our world to physical and spiritual health. And may we sing the praise of His glory. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Peter Carter and Dr. Jennifer Donaldson. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Heck Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole, from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is the first movement of Trio Sonata No. 6 in G Major by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Peter Carter. We look forward to having you join us next time, and until then, may we sing the praise of His glory.